Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you, and uh, I'm a late addition to the workshop, but it's <laughs> nice to be here. So this is, um, you know, so joint work with my students, Farong, Niranjan, and Mohammed. Uh, but overall, this theme of using uh, tensor decomposition methods for unsupervised machine learning uh, is something I've worked on over like the past one and a half years. Uh, so you know, I was recently at the workshop. Uh, at IASC, so I gave a much longer uh, series of lectures there on uh, you know, how uh, we can give strong theoretical guarantees for these methods. So the idea is if you want to do unsupervised machine learning, you know, the, the most natural technique would be perhaps expectation maximization or Gibbs sampling. Or you know, more recently, there have been all these variational Bayesian methods uh, where the idea is you do a relaxation of the likelihood to make it much more tractable. Uh, to do the, uh, you know, uh, like an approximation to the maximum likelihood solution. So I would call these as like, you know, various heuristics that uh, do not have any theoretical guarantees that you will be able to learn the uh, model correctly. Uh, whereas on the other hand, these class of tensor methods, we've been able to prove very efficient theoretical guarantees in terms of, you know, very like, you know, low sample complexity, which is a small polynomial in the data dimensions as well as a low computational complexity. Uh, so you know, if you think of the latent variable models, such as topic models, which are very popular for you know, ca categorizing text, such as the latent Dirichlet allocation, for instance. And there are also you know, the, the uh, classical mixture models, such as Gaussian mixtures, uh, hidden Markov models, and more complicated structures, such as uh, you know, tree mixtures, or uh, the parsing uh, grammars and so on. So many of these, uh, you know, we have a survey paper that shows uh, we can use tensor decomposition methods for learning them. So the idea is, you know, these tensors are actually functions of low order observed moments from data. So, and then you, you know, manipulate them to find a decomposition and these relate to the parameters of my latent variable model. So that's the relationship between, you know, like latent variable models and having tensors for uh, learning them. And so in this talk, I'll talk about a specific application of this. And this is one of uh, uh, detecting hidden communities in networks. I mean, this is a very uh, popular problem in so many different uh, domains, right? So in social networks, uh, um, in both, even in theoretical computer science, uh, like you know, looking at what are the uh, lower bounds for when you can detect small communities um, and machine learning, of course, and so on. So here I'll talk about a, you know a much more challenging notion of community detection, where you know the idea is now people can belong to multiple communities at the same time. Uh, the usual notion is that every node is part of only a single community, right? So there's like, think of like hard clustering problem. There are like multiple clusters, and you want to find them from data. Uh, but now if we have the clusters that overlap, uh, this becomes much more challenging. And uh, so the per first part of this work was a theoretical analysis of this model. So we came, had a model where how, you know, people can now belong to multiple communities, and the probability that there is an edge between two nodes is like a you know uh, average over all the community membership, so it's kind of like a joint effect of being present in multiple communities at the same time. And so today I'll talk much more on the implementation side. We uh, deployed it, you know, so we had a GPU implementation as well as a you know, CPU implementation. I'll talk about the different trade-offs as well as you know I'd like to get the feedback from especially like the systems. Uh, side of I know like the things how uh, I'm sure there are various ways we can even improve it further. So that's the uh, overall idea. So you know so as I said like the idea of communities in networks is very popular, right? The whole kind of the notion of communities came from social network setting, uh, where you know bigger like people interact based on what the gr groups or you know beliefs that they have. Uh, so, you know, for instance, I have research interests in multiple areas, machine learning, um, 
uh, you know, signal processing and so on. So, uh, you know, my interaction would be based on, uh, like, you know, with people with similar interests. So that's a very popular notion for having communities in social networks. And you can also think of modeling so many, uh, like, biological, do you know, domain problems in terms of communities, right? So you can think of communities of genes and how uh, the genes are being commonly regulated is based on, like, the groups they belong to. And similarly, like neurons in the brain, uh, like you know how the synapse with one another could possibly be related on the uh, origin of the neurons or their structural and functional properties and so on. So you know, so think of like communities as like kind of common underlying attributes that leads to uh, possibly having more edges from the same group. Although that's not a constraint we'll impose in our method. And you can also think of like recommendation systems through these probabilistic community models, although you know, this is not the only approach that's there for recommendations. So you can think of like reviews on ELP. So users go, they review various businesses on ELP, and uh, now you can ask like how people, you know, how do they pick out which businesses to review, right? So it'll be dependent on the common location, right? The users have to be in the same location as the businesses, and also as interests. Maybe like, you know, there's a certain kind of cuisine they like, so they tend to go and review those businesses more. So, so, no, so the community is in a lot of these applications. Uh, but the goal is how we can detect this efficiently. Right? So in my all, many of these instances, you only observe the network. You don't have labels, so you don't have usually like, you know, information about what the underlying communities are, and you'd like to detect this. And that's what I'd like to stress, that these are unsupervised learning methods. So it's much more challenging uh, because we may not have labels uh, of what communities these people belong to. Okay, so I'll uh, very briefly talk about uh, some of the probabilistic models uh, we've, you know, for which we can provide guarantees through the uh, tensor methods. And also these probabilistic models give intuitions on how you know, these communities tend to be formed from, uh, you know, based on the memberships. Right, so the classical model is the notion of this uh, stochastic block model. So the idea is that you know, people now randomly are placed in, say, communities. So every person is in a single community, and the edges are formed in a conditionally independent manner. So the idea is once I tell you what the memberships of the nodes are, right, all the edges are just drawn independently. So think of it as like there is a higher chance of connection if two nodes are in the same community. Right? So there's a different probability of connection, rather than if they were in different communities, then it would be a, probably a lower chance of connection. But all these edges are conditionally independent. So this is the statistical model, but uh, you know, so this has been studied a lot. There have been you know, methods such as spectral clustering, where the guarantees that you can detect such communities efficiently. Uh, but you know, in reality, especially in large on online social networks, uh, they're more, much more like overlapping communities, right? So like a person does not belong to just a single community, but a group of different communities. I mean, I've just listed some of the networks that I've been involved in. Uh, you know, I currently at UC Irvine, I graduated from Cornell, I was at MIT, I, you know, I was a visiting researcher at Microsoft Research and so on. So, you know, so I have multiple different communities that I belong to. How do I model such you know, notion of memberships into multiple communities. And now if I'm just given the graph, how do I classify people into now multiple communities? Right, so now this is a soft clustering unsupervised learning problem. Instead of assigning like, you know, data to like hard clusters, I wanna now make a soft assignment, possibly having memberships to many different clusters at the same time. So how do I do this in an efficient manner? And uh, so this is the idea of the mixed membership uh, model. This has been uh, in the Bayesian literature for a few years now. So I'll introduce the model. Uh, but then the method we used uh, using tensor decomposition is a novel way to uh, do uh, detection under this model. So what is this model? So the idea is, you know, if you recall, the stochastic block model was that I just assign nodes to having these community memberships. And I'll draw edges based on the community memberships, right? Yeah. Do you assume that some communities are labeled and some communities are not labeled? No, none, I don't have any labels. So this is completely unsupervised, yeah. 
So completely unsupervised problem. So of course, with labels, I could get even better performance. But this is like kind of saying the pessimistic aspect of where I, if I have absolutely no labels. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So it's more like semi-supervised. So this, I mean, you know, so I'll mostly here deal with the completely unsupervised setting, but with some partial label information, uh, you know, in practice, of course, we can get much better performance. But theoretically, that'll be interesting too. Like, you know, how by how much I can show improvement in performance. Uh, so here, uh, the idea is now if I have mixed memberships, so I can now, you know, say have some assignment of nodes. So now nodes can be in multiple communities, and uh, the, uh, they are fractional. So think of it as I'll just normalize the community membership for every node. So it's like, say, you know, this person spends 50% of time on sports, 50% of time on computers, and so on. So I'll have this fractional assignment for every node to every community, like what is the, you know, think of it as the amount of time or the amount of effort in that particular community, right? So this is now more of a weighted membership rather than like the unweighted one in the previous case. And so, and now think of it as like, I want to still use the idea as before that, you know, that the, the chance of connection between two nodes is based on what communities they belong to. The only difference here is that there are multiple communities that a node belongs to. So I'll think of like the overall probability of an edge is due to like the average effect of all the communities they belong to. And because there's a weight associated with each community, it's like the average probability of member, you know, over all different uh, uh, memberships that each of the nodes has. Right? So take like a pair of nodes. So say this is like, you know, 50% uh, you know, uh, like probability of being interested in sports, and then this other person is also interested in sports, you weighted by, you know, if there would have been certain underlying probability of connection if there were pure communities, right? Be but because there was only fractional amount of time spent in those communities by these nodes, you weight them according to that. Right, like the log, uh, yeah, exactly. And this one is uh, tractable, so that would be, I mean, you know, so, so, and also if the probability is so small enough, this linear approximation is a, an approximation to the log linear model. And, uh, and it's not clear, I mean, again, which one would be better in practice, because that one, you know, in general, you cannot have a guaranteed solution uh, to learn the model, whereas this one we can learn efficiently. Okay, so that's the idea, whereas uh, statistically we'll still retain the conditional independence relationships of different edges. So I'm still drawing the edges conditionally independently once I fix all the node memberships. So the only difference here is that I can now have mixed memberships for nodes instead of pure memberships, right? So that's the idea. So this is the mixed membership model. I mean, this was um, you know, proposed by Araldi et al., I think, in 2008. So the inspiration of this model came from topic modeling. So if you're aware, there was this latent Dirichlet allocation, which is, a, I would say, the most popular model for modeling documents. So if there are like, you know, text in the documents, and we want to classify the documents, you can think of the you know, latent variables as the topics. right? So the document can be about sports, politics, medicine, and so on. And the idea is instead of, again, you could think of the very simple mixture model is that each document is about a single topic. But we know in reality this is not a good model. So the latent Dirichlet allocation was to relax it and say, now I can have multiple topics in each document. And this is a similar notion here for communities that I can have multiple communities for every person. So how people connect with one another is kind of a combined effect due to their memberships in all these different communities. And um, so the only thing that's left unspecified so far is how we assign communities to nodes. Right? In, the, uh, in the classical stochastic block model, it was just a random draw. I mean, there's certain probability of like, being in different communities, which is essentially the size of those communities. Right? So I'll just randomly assign nodes to communities with those probabilities. 
But here it's a bit more involved because I want to now have like a you know, vector for each node, right? If the like k communities, it's a length k vector on like, and I have like kind of fractional assignment so I can have like, you know, different uh, kind of uh, proportion of uh, community memberships. So, and so that's the idea that this would be a distribution on the simplex, right? Because like the overall uh, community membership of a node is normalized and the values are non-negative between zero and one. And so, uh, you know, if we draw a community membership vector, it would be on this uh, simplex with k vertices, right? And uh, so we'll take a, and this, uh, you know, the model that was proposed by Araldi et al used a parametric model for how community memberships are drawn, and it's a, a Dirichlet distribution. So you assume that all the uh, uh, node membership vectors are drawn from this Dirichlet distribution, and that has this particular form. So now I'll give some motivations of why this is a good choice for modeling uh, community memberships. So, I mean, you know, just like as a form, it's just like product of like the different dimensions, right? There are like to k dimensions where k is the number of communities and you're just weighing it by like this parameter alpha j. I mean this is known as like the concentration parameter. So let me just you know illustrate like the this distribution in various regimes and then it becomes much uh, very clear on why you know this is very flexible for uh, handling a range of different possible uh, community membership models. So in one extreme if you like uh, have these alpha j's go to zero, so this uh, concentration parameter goes to zero, the probability mass is only on the vertices of this simplex. So this is nothing but the pure membership model, right? So you can only have realizations as one of the vertices. So if it's a vertex, it's only one on one of the entries and zero on the others. So that means like you can have membership only on a single community equal to one and it's zero everywhere else. So we are back to the original pure membership model as a degenerate case here. So this is a richer class of models that also has the pure membership model as a special case. And this is nice. I mean, if like, you know, there are communities that are close to being pure, we can also detect those. Uh, on the other hand, as you keep increasing now this concentration parameter, you have like probability mass now spread all over the simplex, which means now you can have uh, nodes which are in multiple communities, right? But still, if you have this concentration parameter be small enough, in fact, if it's less than one, you can show that there's like more probability mass towards the vertices of the simplex. So this, you can think of it as a sparsity encouraging prior, right? So most of like the, you know, if you look at like uh, realizations from this distribution, so most of the probability mass is only on a few indices. Meaning like, you know, this is also realistic in practice, right? I, I, like a person may belong to just a few communities compared to every possible community. I mean, if the communities are like research interests of a person, there are only few of them compared to all possible research interests. And so, you know, in, in practice, it's like very restricted to, to, to have a single community for every person. But, you know, it's also not realistic to have like all possible communities for a person. Right, so in this model, we can uh, encourage sparsity in um, having uh, community memberships for a person. Yeah, so the model for subset selection is done by distribution over all possible communities. So, I mean, that could be another way of. Uh, sure, sure. I mean, this is doing it in kind of, uh, uh, you know, the thing is, this is tractable, right? So, there are so many different ways to assign uh, community memberships, and in general, uh, those like you know become hard learning problems, and this one is tractable. So that's kind of the trade-off involved here, and uh, that's what I'd like to argue that this is handling multiple different aspects that are desirable, like having like you know being able to have a flexible way to have sparse community memberships, as well as you know have the stochastic block model as a special case, and uh, and also have like a probabilistic in interpretation of communities. So this not only you know in the end gives uh, just like what are the communities that gives you a model. So you, know, you can do link prediction, you can like, predict the structure of the network and so on. So in that sense, it's trying to address multiple different uh, I know, goals at the same time. Okay? And so that's the idea that um, you know, with this concentration parameter, we can tune for uh, the uh, amount, extent of community memberships. 
And the idea is, I mean, just this alpha j is 1 is just a special case where it's just uniform over the simplex. Right? And if you keep increasing this uh, parameter, there's more probability mass towards the center of the simplex. And in the other extreme, it's just a single point. It's just a deterministic value, which is just like equal membership in all the communities. Right? So this is mostly like not of practical interest. I mean, you know, if every node has just like equal membership in all the communities, <laughs> and that's just like kind of the, you know, there's no community structure, right? But that's like the other end of this. Uh, that would be interesting, yeah. But we, I mean, I mean, precisely where I guess where there's like an anomalous community versus like the usual one. Right. 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 Yeah. It's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've mostly kind of you know like the validation we've done is where there's already ground truth available and we are detecting the communities, but absolutely the my no applications beyond. Okay. I mean, except for the normalization, that's what it says, right? If it's completely product form, this would have been completely independent. But I'm normalizing them. So it's kind of a weak dependence because of this normalization. So it is there. There is dependence, but it's because of this form. So it's not like completely arbitrary, and that's what this is saying. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'd like to stress here that uh, you know, you can control the sparsity, and even like theoretically, you can argue that like kind of the sparsity level, meaning the number of non-zero entries in this membership vector, is proportional to this quantity alpha naught is like the sum of these alpha g's. So, I mean, th those are the details. But the idea is, I can have uh, kind of a flexible way to control the sparsity level in my community memberships through this model. So this is the model. Now the question is, how do I learn this? just given the graph data, right? So all I'm going to observe is this graph, and I'd like to classify nodes into the different communities, right? So in this simulated uh, graph here, you see that if it's pure communities. This is the, if you recall, alpha naught equals 0 is like the stochastic block model or the pure membership model. So here nodes, you know, these are all nodes in the blue community here, green and red, so on. Right, so here you can see that uh, I can very easily visually say with what the communities are. Right? Of course, I've arranged them in a nice way to do that. Uh, but once you have like, these overlapping communities, it becomes a lot more challenging. Right? So you can already see visually that the clusters are not as well defined here. So these colors here now represent the mixed membership of a node. So earlier, a node could e either be just blue, green, or red. Right? But now it's a mix of those, and that's what these colors here represent. And as I keep increasing the level of sparsity, it becomes even harder to say what the communities are. I mean, just like the goal of this pictorial is to kind of just, you know, of course, it's obvious that with overlapping communities, the problem becomes challenging. And you can see that even visually here. So more on the implementation part. Uh, so, so could you perhaps take a minute and, and comment on, for instance, uh, algorithms that analyze the community structure? Yeah, so. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So I would like you know put them into two bins, like you know one with like theoretical guarantees and one. Uh, which are like practical, right? So, and I would say like this is the one that has the both. So, you know, so there are many theoretical methods for overlapping communities, but mostly combinatorial, and they are really not practical. Like, you know, you can't even, it's not a realistic method. The other ones which are much, you know, on the practical side, you know, like for instance, Ural Eskovich, I think, you know, one of the methods requires like a non negative matrix factorization. I mean, generally, these are all NP hard problems, and and there are no guarantees that these methods will succeed. So that's one of the aspects of the other methods. The other is uh, 
there are, many of them are not probabilistic models. So you don't recover an actual model, but only say the community labels, right? So this is doing both that it's uh, learning uh, the model as well as giving the communities. I don't think I agree with you, but we can take that off. Uh, but, uh, No, but they're not, they don't go to the global optimum. They just go to the local optimum. In the end, you just do a, if you do a variational approximation, you're doing a relaxation of the likelihood, and then there is no guarantee of how that relates to, uh, but yeah, no, I'm very sure that there is no other paper that has theoretical guarantees for overlapping communities. So, I mean, we can talk offline, but I'm very sure about that fact. Uh, so this is the one that, uh, and also this is, I will I'll show you the results. Uh, these are extremely fast because of uh, being able to parallelize in a natural way. So you know, in most methods, if you have to parallelize, you have to worry about losing performance. But because these are matrix and tensor operations, they're just naturally parallelizable. So that I would also claim to be another uh, strength of this method. But we'll see the details. Okay, so, so here the point of this slide was to motivate the fact that now with overlapping communities, we have uh, a lot more challenging problem on hand being a, in, a, in, a, you know, in the ability to actually tell apart what the communities are, right, and to learn them efficiently. So I won't describe the theoretical part of this work. This appeared in Colt or the Conference on Learning Theory this year. And so here we established that uh, you know, we have a procedure that uh, can correctly learn the communities of all the nodes. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, for even the stochastic block model, which was the special case of pure communities, we got the best possible performance. So these match the lower bounds uh, in terms of both, like, you know, what are the size of the clusters and how densely connected the clusters are. Right, so the idea is if they're very sparse connections for, uh, you know, like edges have like, it's a very sparse graph, it's much harder to say what the communities are. So we can even handle like up to the limit of how sparse the graphs can be and how large each clusters can be. I mean, if the clusters are small, again, it's hard to detect them. So we give bounds on what, you know, how, uh, how these can scale and we can still learn them efficiently. And also with respect to this, uh, parameter alpha naught, right? This was the sparsity level of my community memberships. We also say how the performance degrades as this increases, right? I mean, as you saw even visually, that if I have more overlapping communities, it becomes harder to detect. So now we quantify exactly what it is. In fact, we'll see that like the number of nodes in the network needs to scale only quadratically in this parameter. So the idea is as I have denser and denser Memberships, I need more nodes in, to observe, right? This is like a larger number of samples. And so, but the dependence is only quadratic, which is not, it's, it's not exponential. Like some of the other theoretical methods have like exponential dependence on the extent of overlap between the communities, and this is not the case. And so those were the theoretical results. I won't address them here, uh, but the, I'll give a brief idea of what the method does. And uh, the previous one had, like, you know, it didn't focus on the implementation part. It just, like, kind of said, okay, this is a, you know, method with uh, having, you know, if you can do tensor decompositions efficiently, then you can uh, do the learning. But here we'll, you know, see how when it comes to a practical deployment, there are many more issues that we want to address. Uh, but the main idea that I'd like to emphasize here is, you know, kind of for all these tensor decomposition methods is to think of, um, kind of uh, using the observed moments to form the tensors. So, you know, if you think of like just like the first order moment, right, it's for if it's a, a random vector, then it's like a vector, right? The first order mean is a vector. Uh, if you look at like uh, the second order moment or the pairwise relationships, that's a matrix. So now if you look at third order relationships, that's a tensor. So that's where the tensors come in. They're formed as higher order moments of data. So the idea is, uh, you know, just if you look at pairwise information, that's not sufficient information to uh, get the community. So you need this higher order moment information. Uh, you know, typically, like, you know, when people were thinking about these problems in classical statistics, right, there was very little data. 
So going to higher order moments was not advisable. But now with lots of data, you know, going to like third or fourth order, it's very much like, you know, it's fine. Like you have lots of data. So you can hope to get like good concentration in terms of uh, being able to compute these com quantities efficiently. But the thing is, how do we exploit the additional information in this higher order moments efficiently? And that's where these tensor decomposition approaches come in. Okay, so, so the main kind of the overall goal is I have a, I know this tensor formed from the higher order moment of observed data. If I do the decomposition, I can relate them to the parameters of my model. So in this case, you know, I can relate them to the community memberships of the nodes. So that's kind of the very big picture view of this uh, method, but there are many kind of details in how we go about doing this tensor decomposition. So, so the, and also we'd like to address how we can parallelize it efficiently, scale it up to very large scale, like, you know, the memory, uh, uh, you know, uh, depend, like dependence on like how much memory and so on. And so that's what we'd like to address. So think of it as like, uh, the main contributions of the, uh, you know, part of the talk that I'm addressing now, you know, will be to do the tensor decomposition efficiently, and those mainly consist of two steps. So the idea is, you know, there's, this is a large tensor, like if there are n nodes in the network, this is a n by n by n tensor. We'll see in a moment what exactly that, that, that tensor is. But this is like a n cube object, right? If n is a million or even a billion, n cube is ridiculously high. So if we have to actually form or store this tensor, uh, this would be a very bad idea. But this tensor is actually computed from data. So we'll be showing how we can implicitly manipulate this. And in fact, as like a stochastic gradient descent, so in a very fast manner, like you know, just passing through data, we can update uh, this, uh, uh, like the, the decomposition of the tensor and we can do this efficiently. So that's one of like the main aspects that, uh, although this involves decomposition of a very large tensor, right, a so potentially n cube object, we do this carefully um, by never explicitly forming the tensor and doing it as like a stochastic optimization. So you run through data rather than, uh, you know, doing it as a batch one, which would be much slower. And, uh, and, uh, and also the other aspect is not to do the tensor decomposition in the ambient dimensional space, but to first do dimensionality reduction. So you are now decomposing a much smaller dimensional tensor, and this also makes a huge difference. I mean, this is kind of the same ideas as like, you know, sketching or like various different dimensionality reduction ideas, right? Even if you want to do just like a low rank approximation of a matrix, like you want to do singular value decomposition for very large matrices, you can first do a dimensionality reduction and then do the exact SVD. And this is much faster than trying to decompose the original tensor itself, or sorry, the original matrix itself uh, into its SVD form. And so we'll use all these ideas uh, to do the tensor decomposition efficiently. And there are two pieces of code. One is a GPU implementation. So here, you know, uh, we um, uh, like, you know, wanted to optimize to reduce communication between CPU and GPU. I mean, you know, from the earlier talks, you know, the, we, this was addressed too that the communication becomes a big bottleneck when it comes to GPU implementation. And uh, we, uh, I'll show like the timing results where without you know, worrying about communication uh, to versus having like kind of this device interface where we minimize communication, there's like at least an order of magnitude uh, running time difference. So we can get you know, much faster performance by doing this careful optimizations. And uh, most of the graphs that we see on real data, like if you think of uh, online social network graphs are sparse. So having all these manipulations, like you know, all these vector vector products or vector matrix products as sparse implementations, or even like sparse lanchos for SVD implementation, uh, you know, also made a huge difference. And in fact, like if it's a, a million by million matrix, if you have to just load it onto RAM, that's not feasible. But most of these graphs are sparse, so even on a million node graph, we could load it onto just the memory. Uh, so it makes a huge difference in having this sparse implementation. And probably I won't talk about this in a lot of detail. We also give like kind of statistical basis for 
testing what is a good community model, right? So the thing is, if I also have like ground truth communities. So think on help, I have like for every business, what type of cuisine it is, if it's a restaurant or what location and so on, right? So these are all you can think of as communities of the business nodes. Uh, and I, you know, from my method, I'm estimating some community memberships. But because this is unsupervised, I don't know how to relate the two, right? So I'm like, you know, extracting a set of labels. There are some ground truth labels. And I want to judge how, you know, how well does my method perform? How, why is this a good uh, way to detect communities? And we use like a kind of a p-value test or multiple hypothesis testing to decide the relationship between estimated and ground truth communities and use that as a basis to calculate the error. So again, this usually, you know, p-value tests are very popular in computational biology, but I haven't seen it being used a lot more on the social network side. And this also, I view it as a contribution uh, here. And I'll talk about it at this time. Uh, so how much time do I have? Till, huh? 10 to 15, okay. So then I'll go very quickly. I won't talk about the kind of the, uh, the theoretical aspects uh, but the main idea is that what is the tensor that I'm referring to or till now? It's kind of, you know, thinking about like kind of, in a way it's a neighbor of neighbor kind of relationship, right? So for every triplet of node, I ask how many three stars it's part of or how many common neighbors does every triplet of nodes have, right? So here there's a node A, B, and C, and I'm asking how many common neighbors it, it has in the set X. I'm just like, you know, taking a part of this tensor, like I'm just making all these four nodes into different sets, disjoint sets to remove some in dependency issues. So you know, this makes it much more convenient just to take like each node in this uh, subgraph to be in a different set. So this is the statistic I'll use. So the idea is I'll take a triplet of nodes in these sets here, right, and I'll ask how many common neighbors it has in this set X, right? That's exactly this uh, quantity here. And uh, uh, and, and, you know, if you form it as a tensor, it would be like the outer product of the neighborhood vectors. So this neighborhood vector I take for x to set A, set B, and set C. And I'm uh, finding the, uh, you know, this is like the tensor product or the outer product, right? And I average over all these nodes here, and I get the third order moment. Uh, so this is the idea that this is a third order tensor, because for every triplet I have, I count how many uh, common neighbors I have, right? So that's why you do it for the size of this is like uh, order n cube if each set is like order n here. So I'm just gonna, you know, randomly partition the nodes into four almost equal size sets and then I'm like finding this quantity. Okay, so and uh, in social networks literature using this friends of friends is like the very popular heuristic. But usually, you know, it's like a local test. Usually people tend to see like, oh, if I have a large number of friends to friends, then uh, you know maybe we are in the same community or not. But we are using the measurement in a much more sophisticated manner to get overlapping communities. And the main idea is, you know, statistically, if I look at the expectation of this quantity, right? So if I had the actual expectation, uh, which I don't, but you know, in practice, I only have samples, and I have to argue that uh, even from samples, the uh, the moment I estimate is close to the truth. Uh, but if I had the expected one, it would be just like a rank K tensor. So the idea of a rank K tensor is very similar to a rank K matrix. Right? If the matrix has rank K, it has a singular value decomposition of K terms. So each term is a rank 1 term. Right? And here too, it's the same idea, only that it's a rank 1 tensor here. So if it's a rank 1 tensor, it's like the uh, you know, tensor product of three vectors. And I have k such vectors where k is the number of communities uh, in my model. And so this is the idea that uh, if I, you know, presume this probabilistic model and look at this three star count object, right, this M3 object, in expectation it looks like a low rank tensor. And that's why now I can hope to, you know, uh, learn the model from this object. Right? So this is like much more constrained. If I just looked at a general object of size n by n by n, it would have a very large rank. But because I'm you know, assuming the presence of like these communities, it would have a much lower rank. And so now the question is how I can do this efficiently. 
So, so as I said, there are two main steps to doing this tensor decomposition, right? The task is to find like this tensor decomposition, right? I need to find each of these terms, and I need to find yeah. Yeah, so FA is just some fixed matrices. I didn't, uh, you know, describe what these are. So these relate to the communities. So essentially, once I find these matrices FA, FB, FC, they're related to communities so through some just linear transformations. Uh, the details are in the paper. But the main idea is that it's a, you know, overall it's a rank K tensor, and if I can find this decomposition efficiently, then I can find the communities. That's kind of the very big picture I can give at the moment. It's fixed. It's like K. Yeah, it's this quantity K here. So if the K community is this tensor, would be a rank K uh, tensor. Yeah. So I mean, in real world, we would tune it, right? We can try it for different uh, size number of communities and see which one gets a good fit. And in fact, we can even like, you know, because the first step is this singular value decomposition, the uh, decay of the singular values as well, we can adaptively estimate what the number of communities are. So, yeah, so the thing is there would always be like a limit, like very small communities, no method can detect. So it depends on how small it is. Right? And we could even do it as like a peeling one, and that's what like my students are now testing, that you first recover the large communities, you subtract them out, and then the hope is you can recover smaller communities through refinement. So there are different ways to kind of even push beyond in terms of uh, having detection of very small communities. Yeah, so in the remaining few minutes, like I'll just very quickly describe what the procedure entails, right? So this. Uh, tensor decomposition, as I said, it's much more robust and also computationally efficient to do it in two parts. So the thing is, this is like a third order tensor here, this cube that I've shown. It's a n by n by n object, but now I'm going to reduce it to a much smaller tensor. So this would be the first step, and I can do it through singular value decomposition. So I'll find like a linear transformation that if I along, apply along each of the modes, which I call it as a multilinear transformation, I get a much smaller tensor. And the size of this tensor is only k by k by k, where k is the number of communities. So the idea is, because this is a rank k object, the only kind of relevant number of parameters should be found in this k-dimensional object rather than an n-dimensional object. It's the same idea even for like low rank matrix approximation. Right? If it's a low rank matrix, I need you know even with dimensionality reduction, I don't lose information, because it uh, has these constraints because of low rank. And it's the same idea here, but for the tensor case. Um, and so the idea is, I think, uh, you know, by doing the, these, even these uh, manipulations, just even products carefully, is an important aspect to doing this part. So, so this is the part of like the dimensionality reduction. So for dimensionality reduction, we need to like kind of compute some pseudo inverses uh, and matrix multiplications, and then do like a low rank matrix approximation. And the comment here was to show that you know, these are sparse matrices, but if I took the uh, inverse of this and did it in a naive way, I would end up getting like you know, n by n object where this is a dense one. right? And I don't want to do such uh, uh, dense manipulations. And in fact, if I had to load them on memory, that would not be feasible, because a dense object would be like kind of uh, tens of TB. Whereas if it's like, you know, if I, I know that these are rank K objects, so these are low rank objects, I have to manipulate them directly through their low rank approximations and not do it naively. So even simple things like that and just, you know, showing like how if I manipulate the order of my multiplications, right? So here I'm only maintaining like N by K objects by doing this uh, order of matrix multiplication compared to the previous one where I would form large N by N. Uh, objects. So all, even these simple ideas matter a lot if you think of n as million or even more. And so, so you know, so we kind of you know took care of having uh, like sparse implementations for these uh, multiplications or, and maintaining like uh, low rank approximations of the matrices to do these manipulations. And uh, we also use like kind of some of the standard randomized low rank matrix approximation methods. 
the kind of column subset sampling or kind of Nystrom kind of methods uh, to do dimensionality reduction and then to do like singular value decomposition of only tall thin matrices. So instead of doing a n by n matrix, right, it's like n by k matrices that we manipulate. And th this made a huge difference. And the next part, which I don't have time to go in detail, so the uh, once I reduce the tensor to like a k dimensional tensor, I still have to decompose it. And what we show is this can reduce to an eigenvalue uh, problem on tensors. I mean, this is kind of a nonlinear manipulation of tensor to think of eigenvalues, right? So in the matrix, if I uh, hit the matrix with a vector and if I get back the same vector, that's a stationary point or an eigenvector of a matrix. Here it's the same idea, but it's like a nonlinear operation. Because the tensor has three modes, think of it as a cube, and if I hit along two of the modes, that is like taking in a product along two of the modes, and if I get back the same vector, then it's called an eigenvector. And uh, like, you know, so this involves kind of quite a bit of theoretical analysis to argue that the only stable points of like this power method kind of idea is only like the components of this tensor decomposition. And there are also many differences from the matrix uh, power method, but I won't go into details. I can discuss offline with you. But the main idea is if I, you know, did this as naively as like a batch method and I form this tensor, this would be very expensive. So, and, and also if it's serially done, like I find an eigenvector, I deflate it, I go back again, find another eigenvector, again this would be slow. So what we do is in a stochastic uh, gradient uh, descent of the tensor and in an implicit manner. So we are never forming uh, the tensor explicitly. So here the idea again is to, you know, so these are like vectors which are just whitened neighborhood points. So I take a neighborhood point, I do a linear transformation of it, and I get these vectors here. And uh, so what we show is we can find all the different eigenvectors as this optimization problem. Right, so this is a non-convex optimization problem. In general, this would not have uh, guarantees of uh, approaching the global optimum. Right, but uh, in uh, what uh, we can show is if we make this, this theta is like a cost for orthogonality. So you make it, make it large enough so you can, you know, uh, encourage the eigenvectors to be more orthogonal to one another. And the other part of this objective function is kind of a correlation reward. I want my eigenvectors to be close to the uh, observed uh, tensor that I form from data. So it's kind of balancing the board that I'm simultaneously updating my estimates of all the eigenvectors. There are k eigenvectors because it's a rank k tensor, and I'm uh, you know, trying to maintain them to be orthogonal to one another, and at the same time I want to make them well correlated with my data. And so that's the idea that even though there's a tensor, this is the only update that matters, right? This is the gradient and I'm updating the gradient. And uh, in each step, that is just like taking inner products. So, you know, although this like kind of theoretically involves finding a decomposition of a large tensor, we can do it through just uh, implicit manipulations and never forming this external tensor. So because of like kind of we are relaxing this orthogonality cost and yeah so I mean it depends on like how much how we tune this parameter and in practice what we see is the orthogonality is the most not the most important goal here right because we want to ultimately use it to detect communities so it's not necessary for to make it very strictly orthogonal to one another and that's why we can like save from not doing Gram-Schmidt and those kind of costly orthogonalization procedures because the end goal is not to find an orthogonal decomposition. And uh, so that's the idea. And like if you look at like kind of the uh, uh, running the computational complexity of this method under like a parallel computation model, uh, it's only linear in the number of nodes in the network. And you know, this k is the number of communities because k is usually much smaller than n. Like even in a million node network, maybe there are a few thousand communities, right? Like not much more than that. So this is kind of not as important as like the dependence on n. And, uh, and we can, uh, you know, so even like space complexity, we are only using n times k objects rather than n squared. Like n squared would have been very expensive. And so we're being careful even about that. 
And this variational method was, I would say, like kind of the closest competing method in terms for this model because this, I mean, they assume the exact same model, but they are doing a relaxation of the likelihood and updating it. And it's not as naturally parallelizable as the method here. And also it takes much, like even theoretically, it requires much more computational complexity than Yeah, but we are uh, estimating the parameters of the model. So from that, you can then compute. Yeah. But uh, you would not be able to uh, say anything about individual community memberships, right? Uh, this so, so, you know, so we get the uh, community uh, uh, memberships for every node. I mean, that's what the tensor decomposition, I'm, I didn't give the details. So once we find the tensor decomposition, we uh, get back the estimates of what the communities are for every node. So, and so I'll very quickly maybe then just give the experimental results. I won't talk about the code optimizations. This was the part saying that, you know, on the GPU, we minimize the uh, communication uh, for uh, computing these uh, eigenvectors. So we store the eigenvectors in the GPU itself as a device interface and only move the data points to update the uh, stochastic gradient descent for tensor decomposition. And this gave like an order of magnitude difference in terms of the running time. So this is like the, the best one is the GPU interf you know, implementation with device interface where we minimize communication. The other one is this uh, standard interface for cooler. This was just like kind of the CPU one with sparsity. So I think uh, like, you know, if it's small enough number of communities for sparse data, this could be competitive. But as I increase it, this is like the GPU one because of the parallelism. So this was synthetic experiments. So this was for like the, just the part about the stochastic gradient descent for tensor decompositions. And this was just like the coldest MATLAB toolbox for tensors. That's kind of the most, if you're just starting tensors, that's the easiest one to use. But of course, MATLAB, you know, it will even crash after like some, I think, few hundred communities. So it's not uh, very scalable. And this one here, it, there's only dependence on the number of communities because we assume it, there's already dimensionality reduction. So you know, the number of nodes does not matter because in this step, we've already reduced the dimension of the tensor and made it a k-dimensional tensor. So the only dependence would be on k for this part of the method. So this only part of the method that we have uh, given the timing in this plot. And the, the main difference I wanted to bring out was that by reducing the communication to the GPU, we can get a uh, gain in terms of running time. So this k here is from like few hundred to few thousand here. k is the number of communities. And this is only like not the entire algorithm, it's only the part of the algorithm. Yeah. So you have a sense for the number of non-zero So this is just, this was actually the dense setting, like you know, we use just the dense one. So in that sense, like I guess, only if the number of communities is small. I, so I think this part, actually, you're right, is not due to sparsity. But like I think because if it's very small, you know, the communication still has an overhead with the GPU. So if you do it right on the CPU, uh, maybe it's good enough. But as I have more and more communities, the parallelism of the GPU helps me to do better. And I think that's why there's this crossing here. This is a CPU implementation with the Eigen library. Okay, so this was for the uh, stochastic iterations. I won't go into these validation. Let me qu quickly go through the. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. So just one minute, just uh, because this is just the main result I wanted to show. And uh, so you know, so the main result I'd like to emphasize is the largest one we've run is about a one million uh, by a, you know node network, uh, and this one took just about one and a half hours to run. Uh, this is including the time that was needed to load the data onto the memory. So the actual execution of all these uh, algorithm was around 10 minutes for the method. And the other, the competing one, the variational one, is extremely slow compared to this. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, so that's kind of the main result. Uh, so, but I guess we'll take more discussions offline. Sorry about running over time. So 
uh, no, I mean the thing is after dimensionality reduction it tends to be dense if you have already multiplied but we can keep them as sparse ones you know so we can kind of do it on the fly as well as sparse manipulations. So everything we are kind of doing it on the fly. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. We can get any more. Yeah, yeah, thank you.